Hey there folks, Jeff here, your tabletop technician on the Dice Tower, and today I'm gonna to look at a slightly older game that I have had a lot of fun playing over the past year. And I'll tell you, I had a lot of cute ideas for funny intros to this, and I could not think of any that were not gonna damage the game, or maybe my house. So I'm just gonna... Drop this on the table here. This is Hibachi, a silly, fun dexterity game about making Hibachi. And I think the best way to explain this is to just open her up. I think we took that journey together. I, I, I think we did. Hibachi plays on this large two-layered griddle, I mean board, showing a variety of tasty ingredients like shrimp, onions, and mushrooms. Players will be trying to acquire these ingredients in order to prepare delicious Asian recipes. To obtain those ingredients, they'll use these poker chips with a variety of values of yen shown on one side. In turn order, players will toss these chips onto this board, and of course there are... Provisos, a, a couple of quid pro quo. For example, a player's arm may not extend over the table during their toss, and any chips that skip off of or otherwise miss the board during the toss are not rethrown, so accuracy is key. Now, in addition to the nine ingredients shown on the board, there are also these four action spots which players may take advantage of. These may change the first player for the round, let a player hold a private recipe card only they can prepare, choose an ingredient card of their choice from the deck, or allow a player to throw one extra chip. Now, so far I've mentioned players getting to take ingredients or actions based on the spots on this board, but let me explain a little better how that works. First, after players have thrown a number of chips at the board, which may not be the same number of chips on the board, and that number varies based on player count, but whoever is then the head chef, that is the one holding this little soy sauce bottle, will first resolve these four action spots on the board. And to do so, they'll inspect every chip on or near that space to see if any art of the space is visible through the little hole in the middle of the chip. If so, the chip is considered valid and it'll be flipped face up. The player with the highest value chip on an action space will get to take that action and then all chips on that space are returned to their owners. Up next is the chili phase. Now there are a limited number of these chili cards in the game. These count as half of a wild resource, so you can use two of them to replace one ingredient in a recipe, which you can only do once per recipe. Now, chips that did not land on any of the 13 spaces on the board get returned back to their owners, but they receive a chili card for each one of those invalid chips. Now I did mention that these come in a limited supply, so if at any point a player would receive a chili card and there are none left in the supply, the player who has the most chili cards must forfeit all of them back to the supply, and then the distribution of chili cards resumes. So you don't want to hoard these things. Then the head chef, which may have changed by now, will resolve the nine ingredient spaces in an order of their choice. This step gets a tiny bit fiddly, but you'll start by flipping over all the valid tokens on an ingredient space. If any player is holding one or more cards of that ingredient, they can sell any number of their cards for the total value of all chips on that space. Players don't have to have a chip on an ingredient in order to sell that ingredient, but if they do and they choose to sell, their chips will be returned to them after all players have had a chance to sell. Then players will have a chance to buy that ingredient if any are available on the matching space around the edge of the board. If so, the player with the highest total of their own chips on the board gets a chance to purchase one of those cards at the price of that total. They then remove their highest valued chip from that space, and the next player with the next highest value, which could be the same player, has their chance to purchase. This will continue until either all the chips or all the cards have run out, whichever happens sooner. Finally, it's time to get cooking. Starting with the head chef, players will spend their ingredients to prepare a delicious dish, either from the three recipes on display or from any private recipes which they may have been able to reserve earlier in the game. Now, you can only prepare one dish from the display each round, but you can complete as many of your private recipes as possible. The first player to complete a third dish immediately wins the game. If at the end of the cooking phase a winner hasn't been crowned, then new recipes are dealt to the display, new ingredients are dealt to the edge of the board, the soy sauce is passed to the next player, and a new round begins. Now in addition to the base game of hibachi, there is the hot and spicy expansion, which adds components for a fifth player, and new recipe cards for which chili is actually a required ingredient, though chili can still be used to replace a single ingredient of the recipe. 
Hot and Spicy also adds unique player powers as well as small player boards to help keep things organized. Now there are five unique player powers, but they're all not quite created equal. One player gets a $0 chip, which could let them buy an ingredient at no cost, or just get free chili for free. One player gets to peek at all the face down chips on a single space of their choice before throwing their last chip, which, of course, might not even land on that space anyways. One player can choose to physically place one of their chips on top of one of their already thrown chips on the board, assuming they have one. One player can use these chopsticks to flick one of their discs already on the board before resolution of any of the spaces begin, but they must flick the chip from the edge, not from the hole in the middle. Convenient, but still tricky. Lastly, one player gets to use those same chopsticks to physically pick up and relocate one of their chips before resolution of any of the spaces begins, and they can use the hole in the center of the chip to help them do this. And I'll tell you, that last player is pretty powerful, as picking these up with chopsticks is pretty easy. I think I've used these player powers maybe twice, and in every game, players complained about that player, which at least once was me, for pretty much the entire game. Honestly, whenever I introduce this game to new players now, I'll hand out the mats to keep things organized, but pretty much forego the player powers. Lastly, there's the fried egg promo token. This one is pretty fun and pretty simple. At the beginning of the round before any chips are thrown, the head chef will toss this egg onto the griddle, and wherever it ends up by the end of the round, the space underneath it is nullified from use. That could be an action space, an ingredient space, or the entire remaining area of the board, meaning no one gets chilly in that round. And on that note, let me get to my thoughts on this game. Hibachi is fantastically random chaos. Knocking each other's chips around, mostly on accident, but occasionally on purpose, is hilarious fun, especially when you can knock that egg token onto a space that someone was really counting on for that round. Of course, this means this is not a game that you can take that seriously. You could line up that perfect shot, trying to take into account wind speed, air density at elevation, or the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow, and then... And that's what makes this game fantastic. Every time I bring this out, I start by shoving all the chairs out of the way and telling everyone to stand up because you want to move around this board, trying to line up that shot, trying to use this raised edge as a backstop to put that chip exactly where you want it to go. And there will be frequent moments of cheers and jeers as someone's chip ricochets off the table or when they land that chip exactly where they want it to go, only to have the next player plink that chip off to chili land. I've played this at game nights, I've played this at local pubs. It gets everyone's attention. There's tons of laughter and poking fun, and it always seems to last just the right amount of time. I even got surprised by this one night when one of our high-ranking directors in my company showed up randomly to a game night. And not only did he win this, he had an absolute blast playing it. You want to talk about propelling my social status in the company? That was a great memory of this game. I will say that the rules are entirely too wordy and complex for a silly, simple dexterity game. And honestly, I think it's a problem with a lot of modern dexterity games. Flicking a thing with a thing is very simple until you try to attach that to some sort of theme, be it space warfare, the wild wild west, or Asian-inspired cuisine. The nice thing with hibachi is that only one player really needs to know the rules, and they can just walk everyone through as you're playing the rounds. Whenever I bring this game out, I always teach the basic concepts of throwing chips to get ingredients, using the ingredients to complete recipes, and then I run through the resolution stages of selling and buying, letting the head chef make their decisions where applicable. Someday, I'm going to go to a bank and get actual yen currency to replace the paper money in this box. Because hilariously, each player starts off the game with 1,600 yen. Across five players, that's 8,000 yen, which comes out to roughly 62 American dollars at the time of this filming. Is this game worth another $62? <laughs> of course not. But that's the beauty of Hibachi. You can make some pretty bad choices and still have a really great time. Cheers. <laughs>